I was asked to speak on the subject of yoga and ecology. It brings to mind a story that took place some years ago. I was sitting in the New Delhi airport at the gate waiting for my flight, minding my own business. I had just given many lectures and sometimes being at an airport you get to rest a little because you don't have to talk to people so much. But just then, somebody approached me and said the minister for the federal government of India for the environment and forestry was sitting nearby and she wanted to speak to me. I said, I'll be happy to speak to her. So she sat on a nice little plastic seat beside me. And after some very gracious and cordial interactions, her voice raised and she said, what are you yogis and swamis doing for the environment? The rivers are polluted, the oceans are polluted, the air is pollution, the whole earth is being polluted. It's poisoning with toxins the whole human civilization. There are animals becoming extinct due to the way we are exploiting Mother Nature. And you're sitting in your ashrams and in your holy places chanting your mantras and meditating and doing yoga asanas. What are you doing for the environment? In my heart, I was thinking, I really don't need this. <laughs> but I had to say something. I shared my thoughts. If there is a disease in the blood of a person's body, it may have the symptoms of boils. Now it is important to treat the boils by putting compress or salve. But at the same time, we should address treating the root cause of the problem. Otherwise, you keep curing one boil after another boil after another boil, but they keep growing again and again and again unless we address the disease in the blood. What is the root cause of the pollution within the world? It is pollution in the ecology of the human heart. People's hearts are polluted by toxic greed and egotism. Greed intoxicates. The more it gets, the more it needs. It hardens the heart, justifies cruelty, induces envy. It divides families, provokes wars. And greed blinds us of our real self-interest. Unless we address that problem, then everything we do is cosmetic. Whatever change we make in the outward world only has sustainability to the degree that those changes are paralleled within our hearts. Yoga is the science of cleansing the heart and tasting the joy of living in harmony with God, 
with all other living beings and with nature. I said to this minister that I can assure you that even if you clean every river and every ocean and every grain of ground in the whole sky, if it's not paralleled with cleansing the values in the human heart, all this pollution will all come back again and again and again. When she heard this, she was actually very happy. She said, yes, we should work together. Yoga is about establishing character in people's hearts. Real character is the willingness to make personal sacrifices for a higher ideal. Willingness to embrace those ideals that we hold sacred, even in the face of temptation or fear. Yoga is meant to bring about from within our own hearts genuine compassion for the well-being of other living beings. This is the greatest need in human society. There's a law of economics, an environmental law of economics, that what we take, we must return. And what we return is what is going to come back to us. So we are taking so much good from Mother Earth, and we are returning with toxic waste. And therefore, eventually, what is returned is toxic poison to us. We must take responsibility. This education in values is so important. Mahatma Gandhi, he once said that the earth can provide all the needs for everyone, but the earth cannot provide enough even for a few people's greed. And one great thinker once wrote, you can never get enough of what you do not really want. What is it that we really want? This is the basic principle of yoga. Ananda Mayobhyashat, the Brahma Sutra says, everyone is by nature looking for pleasure. The Bhagavad Gita tells why. We have this body. The body is like a vehicle in which we are perceiving the world. We're seeing through our eyes, hearing through our ears, tasting through our tongue, feeling through our flesh, smelling through our nose, thinking through our brain, loving through our heart. But who am I? The body's changing. At one time, we were little seeds in the womb of our mother. And then a little head formed, and, and fingers started forming, and feet and toes started forming, and then lungs, and heart, and kidneys, and gallbladder, everything starts forming. And it wasn't that our parents had a master engineering plan of what stages each thing is going to develop. They didn't know what was going on. And we didn't know what was going on. It was happening. Incredibly. 
miraculously. And then we're little babies, and we grow through childhood, through youth. Now I'm just going on 60 years old. So the body changes a lot. And some people may think, well, I'm not the body, but I'm the mind. But how many times does the ch mind change, sometimes even within one minute? You can be happy, and then one little mosquito bites you, and it could ruin everything. Yes, or somebody could just say one word to you, and we're so dis disturbed. Body's always changing, mind is always changing. But we are that witness that is perceiving life through the body and through the mind. What is it that gives satisfaction to the real me? There's a simple analogy of a lady who had a bird and spent a tremendous amount of energy decorating the cage. And when a neighbor came by, she said, look at this beautiful bird cage. And it was the most beautiful bird cage that the neighbor had ever seen. But she was horrified because the bird inside was dead due to starvation. The purpose of the cage is for the bird. <laughs> now this may sound like a very simplistic story, but it's the story of life throughout this world, throughout history. We are putting so much energy into the conditions of the body and mind, which is necessary and important. But yoga means to harmonize the body, the mind, and the living force, the soul, which is seeking pleasure. And what is that pleasure of the soul? We can understand that in our common life. The only pleasure that really touches the heart is the pleasure of loving and being loved. It's our most fundamental need. You can have so much, but if you don't have someone to love and you don't feel loved, it's all superficial. It's all like a decorated cage but no substance for us. The Gita explains why this is common to every living being. Because the Atma, or the life force, is Satchidananda. It is eternal, full of knowledge and full of bliss. My Gurudev, Srila Prabhupada, gave a very nice example. When a drop of water falls from a cloud, originally, it's transparent and clear. But when it comes in contact with the earth, it becomes muddy, loses its transparency. Now, it's not that the water is mud. It's something different than water, mixed with water, that makes it muddy. When you filter that water, you simply bring it back to its original quality. Yoga, or true religion, or spirituality, is the process of filtering our consciousness to cleanse the pollution from the consciousness and allow our original, natural, transparent state to be realized and experienced. There is a lot of talk about what has happened recently in the Gulf of Mexico, which is actually not too far from here, as far as I know. I'm from Bombay, so I'm not so geographically aware of America's geography. But in the Gulf of Mexico, there was the digging of these holes in the bottom of the ocean and due to neglect, 
It was an ecological disaster. Some people say it was the greatest ecological disaster created by human beings in history, which may take thousands of years to recover from. This is what some experts are saying. And when they were struggling like anything to try to somehow or other seal this hole in the ground, they said the problem is it is a mile deep. But factually, it was much deeper than one mile. The problem was the depths of people's hearts. Not being responsible, not living in harmony with nature. Unless human society changes their value system, Not only do we create a mess in the environment, but we cre create a mess among ourselves and within ourselves. This is of prime importance. Education comes from the word educari, which means to bring out what is within. Religion comes from the Latin word religio, which means to bind one back to one's own essence. And yoga means the exact same thing. To reunite us with our own spiritual essence. When we realize our own divinity and our relationship in that divinity, our relationship with nature and our relationship with other living beings. To the degree we understand what we have in common, what our real relationship is as spiritual living forces with every other living being, it will transform egoistic, selfish competition into cooperation where we have a common cause, we have a common purpose, because we're related. Yoga means this, harmonizing through relationships. The asanas, the pranayam, I was speaking on a radio station the other day, and one lady was saying that when she first started yoga, many, many years ago, she thought bhakti is something that she has no interest in at all. That means the yoga of awakening the love within the heart. She was concerned with health and fitness and beauty. So she did asanas and she did pranayam, breath exercises. She told me, that as the years went by, through doing the Hatha Yoga system, her mind became more balanced, her mind became more calm, and in that calmness, she genuinely wanted a deep inner spiritual experience, and therefore, now she's taking bhakti so very, very seriously. So all the different Techniques of yoga, it's like a ladder, different stages to bring us to the point of realizing the divinity within ourselves. And to the degree we do, we can perceive the sacredness in everyone and in everything. There's a beautiful verse in the Ishopanishad. Isavasyam idam sarvam yatkincha jagatyam jagat. In India, this is the primary verse for environmentalists. That everything animate and inanimate is ultimately the property 
of Isha or God, whatever name we may have. And therefore, when we understand that everything is the property of God, including our body, including our mind, including our intelligence, including our abilities, if they were ours, no one can take it away from us. But in due course of time, time takes everything away from us. So it's not really ours. These are gifts to be used in harmony with the divine will. There's a beautiful verse I once read in the Bhagavad Gita. The first time I heard this, I was thinking, yes, that's it. This is what I consider to be what the world really needs to understand and what I really want to live by. May I tell you the verse? Vidyavanaya sampani brahmani gavihastini suni chaiva svapakecha pandita samadarshana. Real wisdom, real knowledge, according to the Gita and the great sages, is not about getting a BA, MA, or a PhD. It's not about having political power. Real knowledge, real success in life is seeing every living being with equal vision. Whether one is man or woman, black or brown or yellow or red or white in color, whether one is Eastern or Western, of any nationality, rich or poor, old or young, whether one is a human or an elephant or a cow or a dog or a cat, or a lizard. Wherever there's life, there's a spark of God. Wherever there's life, there is a spark of divinity. To see that divinity, to honor that divinity as sacred, that is real wisdom. There's a beautiful verse, Sarve Bhavantu Sukena. It said, in many, many different types of rituals in the yoga community. The translation is, let all beings be happy. Not just Indians or Americans or Africans. Not just Hindus or Muslims or Christians or Jews or Jains or Sikhs or Parsis or Buddhists or atheists, or agnostics, or anything else. The essence of every great spiritual path is to reconnect with our own spiritual essence, to be an instrument of the love of God that is within us in the form of compassion to other living beings, and to find peace and love and happiness in doing so in seeing the sacredness of Mother Earth. She's nourishing us like a mother at every moment. Actually, however strong or intelligent or powerful we may think we are, in relation to Mother Earth, we are all like helpless little babies. They're laughing over there. <laughs> What is the relation of a baby with a mother? Complete dependence. Can't survive without the mother's love. We're being provided air and water and sunshine and food. We're being provided these bodies. To honor those gifts means to respect Mother Earth. Today in many places in the world, for one truckload 
of food we take from the earth, we return 30 truckloads of toxic waste. These are realities. The environmental problem is simply a manifestation of the problem within people's hearts. A few days ago, I was on the Dennis Miller radio show. Have any of you ever heard of him? I never heard of him until I was on his show. But I wish I did <laughs> beforehand, <laughs> because he was quite a humorous person. Um, <clears throat> but we were discussing how, according to what frequency a person tunes into, one is going to access certain vibrations, certain energies. If one turns to a, tunes into a particular channel on the radio, he'll get news from Washington, D.C. Another station will be um, a comedy show where everybody's laughing, like next door. Another station will be um, the Dallas Cowboys playing a football game with somebody else. Another station will be the Dennis Miller show where he's talking to a Swami today. So what we tune into, we're going to, we're going to connect with a particular energy. And that's what we're going, that's the sound. That's the experience we're going to have. Now there are so many energies because factually everyone is like an antenna. What our consciousness is, our actions, our words, our thoughts, we are emitting certain energies throughout the universe. There's the energies of, en of, of collective envy, collective greed, collective egotism, collective piety, collective anxiety, collective depression. There's a lot of this. It's not that it's just within us. What's within us is coming out. What are we going to connect to? According to what we focus. According to what we focus on, we're going to access that. Spiritual life or yoga is about tuning in to the divinity that is within our hearts and that is everywhere. Transforming arrogance into humility. Transforming greed into generosity. Transforming hatred into love. Anxiety into contentment. Anger into compassion. One saintly lady once told me that the definition of love is everlasting forgiveness. When we actually connect to the own divinity within ourselves and everyone, that is our nature. So these mantras or prayers or true rituals, they're only so good as they help to tune us in to the divinity of God's grace within our hearts. To access that and be a transmitter of that in our own lives. And there's no greater joy. In this book that I wrote, The Journey Home, I tell of one incident that was really a culture shock for me. I was hitchhiking from London to India. It was in Greece that the decision was made to go to India. But from London to India took about six months because I really had no money. 
I was in a place called Kandahar, Afghanistan, which is in the news a lot these days. But this was in 1970, when, believe it or not, all the travelers I knew who were going overland back and forth across the world, we all had the same opinion, that the Afghani people were the poorest people economically we had ever seen anywhere in the world, but they're the most happy, very hospitable, very kind. Of course, they smoked a lot of hashish, but besides that, <laughs> they were very open. very loving. Somehow or other, due to political invasion, in, invasions and all sorts of political reactions, everything changed over time. But while I was there, I was sitting in a little tea stall. The tea stall was just a very dilapidated shack with no tables or chairs or floor. It was just an earthen ground that we all s squatted on. There was about five or six of us in a little tiny place that was just lit by a lantern. It was night. And they gave each of us a little cup of tea. It was a transparent glass. They don't put milk in their tea. They just have this tea with a little cube of sugar melting in the bottom of it. So we were all drinking our tea. Someone invited me and gave me free tea. Then this boy came in. At the time, I was 19 years old. This boy was probably 16. Materially, he was the most depressive thing I've ever seen. He was skinny due to hunger. He was obviously totally illiterate. He was wearing soiled, ripped up rags for clothes. But the most horrible thing was his eyes. They were blind, swollen, disfigured and there was nothing covering them. My heart quaked seeing this boy's eyes. He carried a single branch from a tree. On one end, he had nailed a little tin can, and then he had a piece of wire strung across it and nailed to the other end. And that was his musical instrument he started thumping this instrument. It was nothing like a guitar or a sitar. It was just boom, 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 like that. I don't think he couldn't, it was only one note and he couldn't tune it because it was nailed. But as he plunked this piece of wire on his branch, he started to sing. He was singing a devotional song to God. And as he was singing, he became so emotional. His face lit up. There was a smile on his lips that was so spontaneous and so genuine, so real. He sang the joys of his heart, the joys of his love for God. And all of us sat for about a half hour, 40 minutes, totally mesmerized. And I remember thinking, this is the happiest person I've ever seen in my life. And it's not supposed to be like this. The way I was raised is you go to college, you get a job, you make a lot of money, you have a good position in society, you have a healthy body, and you'll be happy. Money, influence, health will make you happy. This boy has absolutely none of that, and he's happier than anybody I've seen with all of it. It was a culture shock. 
I had to really stop and think, what is real happiness? If it doesn't come from within, it's not there. Happiness is a state of the heart. It's not a state of what we accumulate externally. If we have everything or nothing, there's a beautiful story in the Bhagavad Purana where a little dwarf named Vamana came to a king, an emperor. And the king said, you are a beggar, I'll give you whatever you like. And the little dwarf said, give me three steps of land. And the king, Bali, he said, why are you asking three steps? When you come to a big person, you should ask for something big. You don't go to um, Bill Gates and ask him for five cents. <laughs> it's an insult. <laughs> he said, I am the king. I am the owner of the world. I can give you palaces. I can give you an entire country to rule over. I can give you anything. Why three steps and you're a dwarf? Your steps are tiny. And Vamanadev replied, you are the king of everything, and you're still not satisfied. You're always in anxiety about somebody taking it away, about somehow, because however much you get, you have to get more to keep what you get. You have everything, and you're not happy. I have nothing, but I'm happy, because I have happiness within my heart. If one has happiness within one's heart, one could be happy with everything or nothing. All I require is three steps. It's a long story, a fascinating story of what happens after that. But the principle of this excerpt is that real happiness is a state of consciousness. And yoga is tuning in to that frequency of the divinity, the love, the ecstasy that is dormant within the heart of each and every one of us and being an instrument of that grace to show compassion to others. Whether we are doctors or lawyers or engineers or accountants, can I tell you one more story? It was in Bombay, some years ago. Advaita Chandra was around at that time in Bombay. I was giving a lecture in a college for accountants. Chartered accountants and certified accountants. There was an auditorium, there was about 400 accounting students in that college. I gave a lecture. After the lecture, one student raised his hand because I made the mistake of asking if there was any questions. <laughs> now, one thing I have experienced is asking for questions in a college or university is subjecting yourself to anything especially in India. So this boy stood up, and he stood up with a grandeur of confidence. And everyone in the room kind of went, ooh. I understood he was known as a very charismatic leader of that college. Everyone's eyes was glued to him. He started yelling at me. He said, everything you said is useless and a waste of our time. I reject it all. What if everyone in the world became a swami like you? Who would do the farming? Who would do the banking? Who would do the trading? Who would help us with our medical needs? Therefore, 
whatever you say is useless. When he said that, there was an uproar of applause and cheering. He got a standing ovation. And then a couple minutes later, when everyone calmed down, they all looked at me. What is your reply, Swami? Would you like to know? I said, what if everyone in the world became an accountant like you? Who would do the farming? Who would do the banking? Who would rule the countries? Who would do the trading? Who would do the take care of the medical needs of everyone? In fact, my friend, if everyone in the world became an accountant like you, the entire world would be unemployed because no one would need an accountant. <laughs> I said, there is a need for farmers, and there is a need for bankers, and for politicians, and for doctors, and for traders, and there is also a need for accountants, and there's also a need for swamis. We are all meant to work together. Human society is like a body. And there's different limbs of the body, and different organs, that perform very unique functions. Yes? The hands have a function that the legs cannot do. And what the legs do, the hands can't do. And what the eyes do, no other part of the body can do. And what the nose does, nobody... All of these different aspects of the body, in their own uniqueness, the kidneys, the lungs, the heart, the pancreas, Everything is working for the welfare of the whole body. So similarly, there's different types of people with different natures and different skills. We're all supposed to work together in harmony for the whole of society. Everyone, the yogic conception of society or varnashram is every aspect of the society is trying to lift everyone else up by living in harmony with God, and living in harmony with each other, and living in harmony with nature. Mahatma Gandhi said that we should try to be the change that we want to see in the world. And that can also be extended. We should try to be the change that we want to see in other people. It's easy to criticize, but it does nothing for anyone. Real heroism is not just criticizing or finding faults. Real heroism is being the ideal that we expect the world and others should be. In our own tradition, we try to tune in to the frequency of the divinity within ourselves through what's called a mantra. The man means mind, and tra means to liberate. Mantra means a sound vibration that liberates the mind, that connects us to the divinity, to the ecstasy, to the love that is within us and within everything. The grace of God. There are many mantras the one that we chant is called the Maha Mantra. It is considered that it includes all other mantras. That is Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Krishna is a name of God which means all sweet, all beautiful, all attractive, all loving. Rama is a name of God which means this, when we connect to him, we derive the ultimate pleasure. Param drishtvani vartate. 
a pleasure that is beyond the ever-changing circumstances of this world. On the surface of a river, during a stormy day, the waves could be very tumultuous. And on a peaceful day, the waves are very mild. If we're on the surface of the ocean, we're, I mean the surface of a river, we're very greatly affected by whatever happens. But if we are going deeper down in the river, where there is a constant current that's unaffected by the external changes. Yoga is about connecting to that inner current of truth that is not phased by honor and dishonor, pleasure and pain, even birth or death. From that state, we deal with the world and we deal with others and as an expression of the great wealth that we have found. Instead of the desperate need to get more things for happiness, we find so much within ourselves. In whatever we do in life, we want to share that. We want to give that. And in doing so, to actually respect and honor the sacredness of Mother Nature. She's not a resource. She's our mother who's providing everything for everyone. And to the degree we find meaning and purpose within our own life, to that degree we can be instruments of real change. We can connect to a power way beyond our own. Thank you very much. I dare to If anyone has any questions. <laughs> oh, what was his response? I have to confess to all of you, although I'm very shy to do so. When I gave that answer, the entire room roared and gave me a louder, longer sta standing ovation than they gave him. <laughs> and he nodded his head and smiled and went like this and <laughs> sat down. Thank you for asking that question. Is there any other questions? Yes. You explained wonderfully the happiness in living in harmony. Thank you very much. Also, you touched on a couple of uh, sub topics about uh, the contamination or you know the world we live in today. Every day when I switch on the television, I see the violence. I see hatredness, sex. How do I? How do we bring in the kids in this particular environment? What's the mantra or what's the message you give to the younger generation? The most important thing is for us to really get the power to genuinely enlighten another person. We have to ourselves connect to that grace within. It's very important. Our Guru Srila Prabhupada, he said, when we're chanting this mantra, we're connecting. And simultaneously, we want to share this information with other people. 
education is so important. A real culture is one that educates its members in universal spiritual and moral values. How to be humble, how to be respectful, how to be charitable, how to really care about our neighbors. In the Bible, the first and great commandment is to love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And what is the natural result of that? That you, know, that you love your neighbor as yourself. When you love God, you'll see that every living being is my neighbor. Everyone. All classifications of human society and all species of life and the trees and the plants and Mother Earth and all of her resources are our neighbors. We should, we should learn to be grateful, to be respectful, and to love. That is culture. That, that is real humanity. This should be the foundation of education. And on the basis of these values, we should build upon that foundation whatever our career may be. Whether, be, whether we're in the stock exchange, or whether we're lawyers, or politicians, or an industry or business. There's nothing wrong ecologically with oil. <laughs> oil is a gift of nature. The problem is when we exploit it without concern for Mother Earth and use it in such a way that's polluting for the purpose of greed, then it becomes a problem. Everything in this world is beautiful and sacred if we honor human values. And this is all important. And if we live by these values and make it a priority in our life to build on that foundation, whatever our career may be, then we're making a difference. And we try to connect with other people who share that same interest, to create a satsang, a, 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 a holy assembly of people who really want to make a positive difference in this world. And whether we do a little or whether we do a lot, is not worthy what's important. What's important is we're doing the best we can with sincerity. Does that answer your question? Yes, Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I'm asking slightly off subject. Is that permitted? I'll tell you after you ask. Okay. <laughs> so I'm assuming after. For 40 years of Bhakti Sadhana, okay, that you have been dipped in that love dripping bhakti, and at the same time, something has emerged that you are that. So, how then do you hold that I am that, and yet simultaneously be in devotion to that? In bhakti, our goal is to be the servant of the servant of the servant of the Lord forever in love. That's what we want. I am that means I am that eternal being who is an eternal servant and eternal lover of God 
That is our aspiration. That is our goal. And in being an eternal servant of God, we become the instrument to be an eternal servant of every living being. Because everyone's a part of God. And to the degree we become purified through yoga or through bhakti, we actually serve with real love, with real compassion. Does that answer your question? We don't believe that we become God in all respects. God is God. God never falls into illusion. God never falls into ignorance. God never falls under the false ego. We are parts of God. We are God in quality. Satchidananda. The example is the sun and the sun rays. The sun planet is full of light and heat. And every sun ray is identical because it's full of light and heat. But the difference between the sun ray and the sun planet is we are little parts and the sun planet is the source of all of us. And we're all, all the sun rays have a relationship because of our relationship with the sun planet. So we believe that the perfection of life is not to be God, but to love God. And, to, and in loving God, to actually love each other. And in that love is to see. Is there any other questions? Yes. So how did you recognize when How did I recognize when I found happiness? I'm very happy seeing you, actually. <laughs> All book, Journey Home. <laughs> but I was seeking, I was seeking meaning and fulfillment in life. I was a teenager in the 1960s, which was an extremely tumultuous period in American history. There was practically a war between generations. I was very concerned with civil rights because the African American people didn't have them then. And it just was appeared to me to be a total contradiction and hip hypocrisy from everything American stands for, and I was seeing it everywhere. And the Vietnam War was raging, and people were getting killed for something they didn't believe in, and they were forced to go. And the music all around us was revolting against the established way of thinking. And here I was, just a little guy, trying to grow up. <laughs> Seeing all this stuff being influenced and invaded by all directions, by all these apparent contradictions, and this whole energy toward revolution. And I joined the, I joined the counterculture. Because I wanted to see a change. Didn't make sense. But as time went on, I saw that the counterculture had the same problems as what they were revolting against, just in a different package. It was just a different kind of ego and a different type of way of judge, judging others. And gradually, I came to the conclusion that to make a real change, to find real fulfillment and meaning in life, there has to be a spiritual experience. And this took me on this path. And I studied various religions under many teachers. And ultimately, when I met my guru, Srila Prabhupada, in the path of bhakti, in my own life, I found 
the universal essence within all. And here was a person who was really a living example of real compassion and real wisdom with such a beautiful conception of God and such a beautiful unifying philosophy that sees every living soul as equal. And I tried chanting this mantra and I actually felt in my own life that tuning in to the frequency of grace within me. And gradually, I dedicated myself to sharing this great gift. Does that answer your question? Our Guru Dev used to say, he used to quote a verse, Savai pung shang paro dharmo yato bhakti radhoksha je ahoitiki aprati hata yayatma suprasidati. The supreme religion, the supreme yoga, the supreme occupation for all humanity is to connect to that love of God within ourselves and be an instrument of that love. To the degree our love is unmotivated by any selfish interest and uninterrupted by any circumstances, to that degree our love actually gives real satisfaction to the heart. That real spirituality is not about being a Hindu or a Muslim or a Jew or a Christian or a Buddhist or a Jain or a Sikh or a Zoroastrian or anything else. Real spirituality is to love God and to be an instrument of compassion with character and values. And wherever we find that, we understand that's it. I thank you very much. Did everyone hear the question? Can you say it very loud because you're so soft and sweet natured that nobody can even hear you? Um, I was wondering what the practical application of um, all the things you spoke of respecting Mother Nature and taking care of the environment, how can we practically um, follow those principles as well as following a path of yoga or spiritualism? When we understand that Mother Nature, or Earth, Bhumi, is actually, the f within this material existence, the feminine aspect of God, by honoring, not exploiting, but honoring and respecting, that's, that's a very integral, serious part of our spiritual path. That's how we love God. <laughs> it's a part of how we love God. How we honor and respect other living beings and how we honor and respect Mother Earth and all of her resources. So we should all be conscious as an act of devotion, as an expression of gratitude and love from the heart. We should live in such a way that as far as possible we make choices that are sustainable for our environment. You see, the real changes that are going to come out is when individuals make these choices. We can use plastic, or we can use something else. Plastic pollutes forever. It can't be absorbed unless it's recycled. We make choices, and this actually gives us a sense of character and integrity when we make choices that are sustainably, sustainable and ecologically respectful. 
We can choose to use recycled things instead of just keep wasting more and more and more and more things. We can get a little bit of an education of what really we can do to make a difference. We don't need to accumulate more and more and more stuff. What we need to do is have a meaningful purpose of what we use our stuff for. <laughs> it was once at a very wealthy person's house and in the basement, they had literally tens and thousands of dollars of entertainment and toys for their son. They had computer games and they had pinball machines and they had these electrical arcade type of games and they had every game you could think of and every type of toy you could think of. It was a huge basement. And I saw the boy was always in an anxiety. He always wanted something else and something else and something else and something else. And a couple days later, I was with one family. They didn't have much of anything. And I saw their little son, the same age, totally blissful and content playing with an avocado seed. We don't need all these things. This is something very new. This idea of the more we consume, the more happy we're going to be. Actually, the higher our values and character, the more happy we're going to be. And we can make choices that are friendly and respectful to the environment. The golden rule, what we take, if we take good from the environment, we should give back good to the environment. It's not that we take good and then we give back toxins. And we can make choices in our own lives. And those choices are acts of divine service. They're acts of worship to the source of everything. Does that answer your question? To think that we can be spiritual and be completely negligent about the environment is a contradiction. It's a very shallow way of being spiritual. And that type of hypocrisy is not going to give much inner satisfaction to ourselves and it's not going to be very convincing to others either. <laughs>